Um, you're all very welcome to tonight's webinar, um, which is our webinar exploring our world of languages provocation pack. Um, tonight, the webinar will highlight how the provocations pack can be used in practice and we hope that you will experience the webinar as a real opportunity to ask questions, seek clarifications about the pack itself, because now that you've had a chance to work with it over the last few weeks, it's a different approach we've taken with this particular pack, um, giving people access to the contents before the webinar. We're really interested in getting that feedback from you. My name is Teresa Heaney. I'm the CEO of Early Childhood Ireland, and I'm delighted to have been asked by my colleagues to uh, chair this evening, to open, to welcome, and to uh, guide us through the questions and answers at the uh, at the end of the webinar. Before I welcome the speakers, I want to let you know that the webinar is being recorded and that's going to be another useful resource to go with the suite of resources that have already been developed with the provocation pack and the toolkit. So, as I said tonight, there's an opportunity to ask questions, add comments and experiences about using the pack. And in order to do that, I would encourage you all to use the chat function throughout the evening. Uh, you'll see it at the bottom of the screen. So please type any questions that you have about the pack there. And some of my colleagues will be gathering those questions together and we will then use those to guide the Q&A uh, at the end of the session. So uh, enough from me, and uh, I'm now going to tell you what's about to happen. Uh, our first speaker for the evening is Melitza Atnakovic, who works with Early Childhood Ireland as the manager of our membership excellence and learning team. Um, Millie has worked in early years for over 16 years and she's worked in a variety of roles as an educator, a manager, a trainer, and she brings a great combination of her experience and interest in the arts to her work. She has worked as part of the OIL project team and has brought fantastic pedagogical expertise to the project design and its development. Millie will give you an overview of the project. She'll set the context for you. She'll let you know who, how it was developed, who was involved and its aims. Um, Millie will speak for about five minutes and then she'll hand over to Francesca. Francesca has um, got so much to share with us. She has also worked on the OWL project and she is a founder of the Mother Tongues organization. Mother Tongues is a social enterprise working to promote multilingualism and intercultural dialogue. And it's the first social enterprise in Ireland to employ a creative arts-based approach to empowering parents and children to embrace their mother tongue. So I think with that, I'll hand over now to Millie to begin tonight's webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Teresa. So good evening, everyone. We're absolutely delighted, as Teresa said, to have you here with us uh, to explore the exciting world of plurilingualism, uh, arts-based approaches and nurturing belonging in settings. We're delighted to have an opportunity to, opportunity to share the OWL project and the provocation pack with you. I suppose it's really, really important for us to extend our thanks to the providers, the educators, the families, and of course, the children who joined us and helped us learn so much um, on this exciting programme. So OWL stands for our world of languages, but it's not just an acronym. It really represents a vision, and that's a vision of Mother Tongues and Early Childhood Ireland to support educators to create inclusive environments and culturally responsive pedagogy that really empowers children to embrace their diverse linguistic backgrounds while also nurturing their sense of self. So a little bit about me. 
Um, this is my dear old dad. And I've spoken a little bit about this before, but I think it's an important reminder. So my name is Melitza Atanackovic. I was born to a Serbian father and an Irish mother. And when I was a child, my father really didn't often speak in his mother tongue. And this, as many of you know, can really create a subtle but significant barrier to a child's sense of identity and belonging. And I remember moments when I wished I could communicate with him in his native language to really fully understand and embrace that part of my heritage. And it really always feels like a missing part of my identity. And I suppose this is why, why the OWL project, you know, really resonates with me so deeply. You know, it, it's a project that was born out of, you know, the understanding that every child deserves to experience the richness of their cultural heritage and to celebrate the languages that connect them to their roots and to keep them connected to those roots. And, you know, we must always recognize the profound impact that early year settings can have on a child's sense of self, but also on supporting children and families to maintain those connections to their cultural identity. And, you know, during this project, I, I spoke to a Croatian dad and, and he said to me, you know, since she started preschool, so we're talking about his daughter, you know, since she started preschool, you know, we're speaking English at home. And I said, please don't do that. Don't do that. You know, she is going to be learning English. It's a real regret of my dad. You know, he's 86 now and he often says to me, it makes me sad because I feel your connection to Serbia, you know, and, and, and my siblings that it will die with him. So, you know, as early childhood settings, we can really support families and children to stay connected. It really enriches your setting in the here and now. And that support will in the future really benefit children and families. So throughout this webinar, we are going to delve into the OWL project. I'm going to just share briefly some of the objectives and touch on our approach. I'm, as Teresa said, joined by a few of the wonderful team behind it, um, Francesca and Christina, who are going to go more deeply into the provocation pack as well. And as we discuss um, identity and belonging, I really invite you to reflect and to think about your own experiences and your own practice. In our case, we used a purpose-built theatre and uh, puppets and storytelling as tools to help children to explore and express and learn together. And the OWL project was really all about fostering a sense of belonging and cultural identity in preschool children while embracing the beauty of multilingualism. So the key objectives were multilingualism or plurilingualism, plurilingualism, as um, we've now shifted to. Um, so, you know, empowering young children to embrace and celebrate their linguistic diversity through carefully curated activities. You know, we really strived to create an environment where multiple languages could flourish. We also, you know, were very focused on having a um, culturally responsive pedagogy. So ensuring that each child's unique background was acknowledged and celebrated. We really believe that cultural diversity is a strength and that enriches the learning experience. We also were really focused on identity development and, and the L project really aimed to support children in their journey to discover their own identities. We really wanted them to feel confident and competent in their preschool setting um, and knowing that they belong. So, you know, it, in speaking about um, the competency of children for early childhood Ireland and mother tongues, we really always held in our minds as we develop this project and um, the image of the child. So it's important to, I suppose, bring us back into that space. So in the context of language and early childhood development, it's important to always reflect on the image of the child and the competencies of children. The competent child, and I, I suppose I'm drawing here from Lars Malaguzzi's concept of the competent child, that every child has the potential for growth, for learning and understanding from the earliest age. And 
each child's home language is really such an integral part of their identity and competence. And it's not just a matter of English or Irish versus other languages. Each language experience is unique and, and valuable. So in saying that, you know, it's important that we avoid grouping, you know, that we always think beyond groups. There's no one size fits all approach when it comes to children's language development. Understanding each child is just so important. So getting to know each child and their family, this helps to understand, helps us to understand and to nurture a child's unique strengths, um, their needs and, and really supports us to be, you know, inclusive in our practices and to respect the diversity of children's experiences, their backgrounds, languages, and, and that as a, a really rich resource for everyone's learning. So as we designed and conceptualized the OWL program, it was very important to us that it respected the companies of the child, the image of the child. And through insights from evaluation, about the evaluation of this process and this program, it really helped us to focus. It helped the development of the provocation pack and how I suppose the program can continue to evolve over time because it is about that ongoing consistent learning. You know, throughout the program, there were times where we would have differing views on children's competencies in relation to the OWL activities for example, and the arts-based approaches. And I suppose by continuing to have that ongoing learning and to have that continual dialogue and to really reflect on everyone's unique context and settings, we were really able to effectively draw on the unique nature of each child to respect their language and development and continue to share ongoing conversations about how best we support children's learning journey. So in this project, we explored uh, the art of puppet, puppet making and we used a purpose built theatre, as I was um, saying earlier, as a tool for self-expression and storytelling. We had an artist work with us on the development of the storytelling approach. We also followed up the storytelling with suitably designed art activities. And so, for example, children made their own puppets, their own homes within their own theatre. And they were then encouraged to use these puppets or theatre boxes to play and communicate with their peers, um, educators and also their families. So, you know, we observed and we explored how children are encouraged encouraged to converse in their home languages, uh, promoting language development and a deeper sense of self. Family involvement was a really big part of this program. Families joined us and participated in workshops and conversations with their children, creating that really important bridge between home and preschool. And families spoke in their mother tongue. And I have to say the pride of the children hearing their parents join them in their setting and share their language was just pure magic. So one of the highlights of the OWL pilot program was a new, unique provocation pack, but um, I suppose why was it created? So the provocation pack was designed to serve as a catalyst um, for it was to serve as a catalyst um, for meaningful interactions and exploration within preschool settings. Um, it's a carefully curated um, collection of materials and resources that aim to um, really support educators. Um, and we hoped so we hope that it equips educators with the tools to facilitate engaging and culturally responsive activities within their practice. So I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Francesca from Mother Tongues, um, and she is going to explain further the benefits of plurilingual approaches explored in the OWL um, project. Thank you all very much. Sorry, Francesca. Hi. No, I'll, I just wanted to say a couple of, well, just wanted to say good evening to everybody and just probably follow on um, from what uh, Millie was talking about, which is the the time, the effort, the thinking we put into the pack, uh, but also into the project, which uh, I think just while listening 
to uh, Melissa's words, I was thinking about the how carefully, really, we planned every step of the way because there isn't a single good way of dealing with linguistic diversity or cultural diversity. Um, there isn't a booklet out there that tells you that if you do X, you will come up with a, a solution or with an outcome. Uh, so especially when it comes to language development and when it comes to the diversity of language experiences that we meet and come across, uh, we cannot have, uh, like Milica was saying, a one size fits all. So as we were developing the program and the ideas, and obviously this was uh, an initial pilot, we were maybe, you know, we, we had really interesting uh, discussions and conversations and we had the children in mind every step of the way. And we also had you in mind every step of the way, uh, thinking about how we could test something that then could also be applied without having to uh, completely change what you do on a daily basis. Um, and so I, um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about uh, why we as mother tongues uh, believe in the importance of every language uh, and in not only believing in the concept of it, but we also think that by making small changes and by, um, I suppose, reflecting on our practice, we can have a very, very big impact. Um, so it, I would like to start again from the point of view of children, because um, this is why we initially uh, came in contact with Early Childhood Ireland. We wanted to work together on uh, creating an experience that would enhance uh, children's uh, time in an early childhood setting and uh, I suppose allow everyone to be more comfortable with what we have. We don't need to invent linguistic diversity, we have it. Um, we have it within ourselves, within our families, but also within our communities. And that's something that um, I, I think it's important to reflect on as well. So from the point of view of children, um, I think uh, something that we need to keep in mind is that language development for, say, your uh, ideal monolingual child, if you like, is in itself quite uh, complicated. But obviously children are developing two or three or more languages simultaneously or in various sequences is also complex because um, children are very well able to cope with whatever they whatever languages they're exposed to, they use, they hear uh, often when they're so young. If they hear multiple languages, very often they come from family members, from community members, uh, from neighbors. Uh, so they're always relevant uh, because they're part of their life and their daily experience. And uh, many of you will have groups of children that are very multilingual. Some will have only few children who speak more than one language. But you will probably agree with me that you rarely meet two children who have had exactly the same linguistic experience. You would have families where one parent speaks one language and the other speaks a different one. Uh, you would have families where maybe say both parents might be speakers of a language such as Polish, but they might decide that because they met in Ireland, they speak English to each other, but they speak Polish to uh, the, one of their children. And maybe when the second child came along, their life changed. So they started to speak English to the second child. So we don't have an ideal bilingual family or a standard bilingual or multilingual family or plurilingual family. Uh, so we need to be aware of that. This is not a complication in our work. It's the nature of of the work that we do. It's the nature of the linguistic experience of uh, the families and the children we meet. Uh, but I wanted to stress this point as a starting point because um, sometimes we would like to have the magic solution to a question or, you know, we would like to be able to, even ourselves in mother tongues, we would like to be able to give people the 
20 answers to the top 20 questions, but then we meet a family and it's like, actually, I don't fit into any of those 20 questions. My family does not fit into this type of strategy or that type of strategy. So I think it's important that we take this approach. We listen to uh, the lived experiences. Like, like Melissa was saying earlier, it was a decision made in her family not to pass on a language. This decision could have changed and maybe it has changed now and suddenly there's a shift in the family dynamics. But uh, truly, families will rely on your expertise as well. So in within uh, at the very early starting point, so when children are very young, parents will have a lot of questions and a lot of doubts about what they're doing, if it's right, how they feel about it is really important because it's not only sometimes a choice that you make with your head, but it's a choice that you make with your heart to decide to speak or not speak a language or prioritize one over the other. And obviously, you're always concerned about integration. You're concerned about uh, communication skills. So um, information for, for families is important, but also for you to find out what is the linguistic makeup of the family? What are they doing? And even just simply asking the question is a very good starting point to start the conversation about language. And language is only a, a small portal into a lot of other conversations about identity, belonging, and uh, socialization, and so on and so forth. So uh, we touch on language, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about it in a second, but language is really the starting point to have a much deeper conversation. Um, the other point, and I touched upon it earlier, that concerns the multilingual societies or plurilingual families. We, we can talk about terminology later if you like. Um, we often think that language is a problem or an issue or a concern of migrants, uh, of Irish speakers, of activists, while it's something that we all experience. If we're on a bus in Dublin, we hear many different languages, at least I do on the buses and Lewis's I get, I hear a lot of different languages and it's the same in many parts of the country, of course. Um, so if I think about the children that I've met in my work and in uh, even in within my family and my children and their friends, the, um, the main, um, one of the, uh, most surprising things I think I suppose was to meet children thinking that they were this monolingual child because their parents are Irish or they are a bilingual child because one parent speaks X language or they're go to they're going to immersion Irish immersion education and suddenly a child would say oh I can speak a bit of Japanese I remember this once and as I you Japanese was not in the in the questionnaire I gave you at the start of this piece of work and their aunt who is uh, well, uh, the sister of one, the, the mother had gone to live in Japan. So the cousins also speak Japanese. So even though that language is not in the surroundings, it's not in the immediate community, that language me meant a lot to that child. And I wasn't able in that specific context to identify it when I asked through a questionnaire at the beginning, what are the languages in your family? Because I, you know, I probably, I don't know whether it's how the question was phrased, whether it's what the parents were sharing. But when I actually got to speak to children more within any project that I've been involved in in the last few years, I've always discovered something that I didn't know. And, uh, and I thought, actually, there's a lot more to family languages, because family languages extend so much into other relationships and other connections that you will find that children so 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 many children even the most unexpected children will have an interest a connection to another language or another culture and the Irish are famous all over the world for uh, their 
travels and their migration and the places they've been to. So uh, you'll be surprised how many stories you will get of uh, linguistic connections. Um, so going to these other points, I just put a few points because otherwise I will speak all night and we can't do that. Um, so we uh, wanted to have um, a project that would inspire anybody who has seen the um, provocation pack or um, even just the pictures or the tools that we used to um, to say, I want to try this. OK, we didn't say we're going to give you a list of rules. And if you follow those rules, you're going to adapt your practice, improve how children speak different languages. This is purely an inspiration to see okay, in every context, you can try your own tools, you can adapt ours, you can make them your own. Uh, everyone who works with children is super creative, so you'll make even better tools. Uh, but the idea is to start off with the concept that language really matters. And it's a very, very important part of a child's identity, uh, of educators' identity. Uh, I see more and more in preschools or creches that I, I visit that there are more and more staff who are plurilingual and their languages, each one of them has a meaning to them, has a role in their lives. So I think, as I said earlier, it's not about bilingual children. It's not about migrant children. All children can benefit from learning and learning through experience that um, every language is very important to the person who speaks it. And, and another aspect of it is the learning about uh, difference. So introducing, so why we want to introduce plurilingual approaches is that they are for everyone. All children can become more curious if they start to hear different sounds, different tones. You know, when you play songs in different languages, how exciting that is. So um, it new sounds, new, so different languages may have tones. There are tonal languages. Languages have different uh, uh, features, the grammatical features. You don't need to explain them. Children just naturally will start to ask questions and it's very important that we all start to understand that different people express themselves in different ways different it's not only words people gesture in different ways people use their facial expression their gaze they look at you in a certain way and it is cultural it is meaningful and it's important to be aware of it that there isn't a single way of talking there isn't a single way of self-expression and so when we allow for all these different experiences to have a space we are then saying we're giving a very clear message that yes the same way you can spontaneously start to run around and play the same way you can start to draw and it can come from your own imagination yes we are creating a space also where your language is free it's free to be expressed it you you're free to use it you're free to use your friend's language or a neighbor's language because we're all having fun with languages and so many times i've come across contexts where when we invited children to use a different language language especially slightly older children so maybe five-year-olds six-year-olds they would say why or I can't do that or they would feel this is too strange because in this context we're not really doing it and it's not right or wrong it's a habit it's the the, the situation that they're in so you can change that and you can change that through your daily practice so I'll go to the next point um, what I think is also um important just as a as a background to the um to the toolkit that you have to the the provocation pack is that um children uh, it's, language is not just sounds and gestures and various forms of expression but we are also uh, as children children develop lang uh, knowledge through language and this knowledge they can transfer it from one language to the other and this 
we often talk about it when we're looking at children who are learning English as an additional language. Uh, children bring knowledge with them and they can transfer to another one. So many times when we're making comparisons between languages with children of all ages, they start to think of what they know and how they can make it work in another way. They can make it work in another language. And so um, this is another motivation for wanting to use more languages. There is no hindrance. There is no, uh, it's not like a weighing scale that the more you develop one language or you use one language, the more the, one, the other one suffers. Um, I think what's good to, to try is to, mix the languages to use them as much as possible because children will reflect on how this knowledge uh, transfers and applies and sometimes it doesn't apply and that's also part of having different systems um language is also a um starting point to explore other cultures uh as i said earlier finding out about how different people use gesture, facial expression, even the tone of voice, the, the volume of your voice. And uh, also, finally, uh, the final point is, because this comes from you as an educator, you are not only promoting multilingualism through activity, through uh, how, what you say, but you're also, at a, at a higher level, you're giving a message that reaches everyone. You're saying if there is space for every language, there isn't a language that is more important than others. I think this is a very difficult message sometimes to get across. Uh, but when parents see, and we've spoken earlier about the involvement of parents, but when parents see that their language has a space whether that is through storytelling, through um, maybe you ask them to write down a few phrases in their language to bring in, uh, to teach them to everybody, uh, then parents sometimes are skeptical. They're like, well, what, why do you want to know this? Are you not just focusing on English or Irish? Um, but this openness, when it becomes a dialogue and it's consistent, it signals that you are embracing everyone's language everyone's culture everyone's way of being and the children will follow and the parents will follow too because you cannot expect that parents will immediately jump into this plurilingual approach either so it's a, a piece of work that requires all these three key stakeholders if you like uh, to come together and cooperate uh, and this is not without difficulty, so I could uh, go to the next slide now, uh, because there are many old myths. Uh, I'd say you can read all of them. There are some that are uh, that you may have come across uh, before. Uh, I mentioned earlier this idea of one language being stronger so if one language is stronger the other one cannot be strong because they there's almost like a uh, it's a given that there's an imbalance or that one language can create problems for the other but we actually know uh, that children can develop two three languages whatever languages are regularly used in a meaningful way they can develop all of them in um uh, uh, maybe at different rates, maybe uh, with different outcomes, but there isn't such a thing as using one language in, in the home, for example, causes a delay in English, for example. So that's a myth. Uh, mixing languages is something that's the second point. It's something that all children do and that um, you might find that some children do more at its certain stages of development, or some families just naturally do more of it. Uh, any Irish speaker in the room will say, will agree that Irish speakers tend to mix, and some speakers are mixing regularly more than others. Some communities mix more than others. So um, it's an individual, um, well, it's a, it's a typical feature of uh, bilingual, plurilingual speech, uh, but it doesn't have a negative effect. Um, and we can I can answer questions later if you have any. 
Uh, the issue of the importance of languages, I think, is also something that we have to reflect on ourselves because, yes, it is a myth that English is more important than other languages, but you might find that other adults, not only yourself, yourselves as educators, but maybe parents or uh, neighbors of the parents or anyone else might say, well, give priority to English and then everything else will come because English is more important, because English is the language that needs to succeed. But what about the other languages? The other languages are not useless. Uh, sometimes we hear parents, I use the word useless because we hear parents use that word saying English is useful, useful it's important, my language is useless. And we all know that having knowledge of more than one language isn't useless for, from so many perspectives. Um, but again, it's part of our mindset. And that's why it is important that we ourselves are aware of our own biases towards different languages. Uh, maybe we might think a language that children will learn in school even, like, or we might not even consciously think, but... Sometimes we see reactions of excitement when children say that they can speak a language that seems more useful to us, like Spanish, say, that you could do in school or you could go on holidays somewhere. But what about a completely different language, a language that we've never heard of before? That language isn't more or less important than an English or a Spanish language or more global languages. So we have to be very mindful about uh, praising children and being enthusiastic about all languages and even convincing parents that they should be also enthusiastic about passing on their languages, their dialects, their ways of communicating. Um, and it is very important at an early stage as well. Um, the other myth is that children succeed in language, in communication, in integration, in developing a sense of belonging, only if they have one culture, one language. History tells us that this one language, one country has never been the way. It's a very recent concept. So a lot of people in the world have plenty of strong languages. And then we often don't have a measure really to tell what language is stronger or weaker. Again, bilingualism requires time. Um, plurilingualism, so to, knowing three or more languages, it requires time, it requires effort from the point of view of the child and the parents, the time the parents have to put into it, especially if they're in a strongly monolingual community. Uh, but children can succeed in as many languages as they are uh, developing with as it was with the input that they get. Um, the, um, the, the, the other point is about language difficulties uh, because it is a myth that often can be um, problematic at an early age, uh, can be problematic at any stage. But when we're dealing with families, with young children, it's quite natural to find that parents are concerned about language development. And the first thing that gets blamed is having more than one language they might say well is it my fault that my child has maybe a smaller vocabulary than the neighbor's child is it because i'm speaking x language and so um we are the ones who have to dispel the myth that bilingualism is the cause of language difficulties if children have language difficulties they should be following any procedure that any child with one language or six language languages would follow. Um, so it's not true that we should only focus on one language, that we should delay the uh, use of a second language. We really need to look at every child uh, for what they are, what input they're getting. There isn't here either a standard one size fits all kind of answer. Um, and the final point is, if I only speak one language well, and this concerns the educator, I can't support children in using multiple languages. And this is one question that we get uh, quite often. It's like, if I, uh, I'd like to apply some of these ideas, I'd like to try them out with my group, but what if children start to speak in these languages or they ask me how to say something because children could will naturally be curious how 
what do I do if I don't speak these languages? Am I still suitable for this role, if you like? And definitely what you want to communicate is your interest in linguistic diversity. There is no expectation that you will learn as many languages as you will find in your settings because it's going to be probably many different languages. Definitely learning a few words, uh, phrases to communicate with parents, to show the children that, look, I can do it too. You know, I, I have uh, some basic Romanian. Say, I, I'm not talking about myself. I'm just imagining this uh, person who could say, you know, I can speak a bit of Romanian and Polish, a few sentences, not to tell you important things necessarily, sometimes just to show you that what you have at home, I've been thinking about it and it means something to me so much so that I've gone out of my way and I don't only speak English, I can also learn a bit of your language the same way you can learn a little bit of your friend's language and your neighbor's language. So it's setting the example. So being so-called monolingual shouldn't stop anybody from wanting to uh, embrace multilingualism uh, or multiple languages and seeing what happens in the process. And so I will... Um, Take your questions later if you have any more, but I just wanted to give a bit of background about uh, uh, linguistic diversity and why we do the work that we do. Thank you very much, Francesca. That was a really, really interesting presentation, as was Millie's before you. Um, and we're getting some great questions and I would invite um I would invite you, remind you to please put in your questions, whatever you'd like to the panelists to talk about, if you would do that in the Q&A function there on your screen. Our next speaker, our last speaker before the panel discussion is our colleague, uh, Dr. Christina egan Marnell, uh, who is an early childhood specialist with us in Early Childhood Ireland. Um, Christina is also a qualified early childhood uh, teacher um, with a degree in early childhood care and education and a doctorate in education from Victoria University in Wellington. And uh, Christina has been working on the project uh, on developing the toolkit. And so she's going to talk to us now about the pack, about the, the toolkit and how it has been designed for use across a variety of ways, including staff, staff CPD, curriculum planning, the physical environment, how to involve parents in celebrating multilingualism and in storytelling. So I'm uh, happy to hand you over now to Christina, over to you. Hi, thank you very much, Teresa, and thank you to Francesca for sharing a wonderful presentation alongside Millie. Some of the points that I'm going to bring up this evening will touch on what they've said. So I am uh, I was really delighted to hear some of the things that they've mentioned. So while Christina is doing that, maybe could I ask um, Francesca to take one of the first questions that we have coming in? Would that be okay? So, uh, Francesca, I have a question, um, which I think probably is experienced by a lot of, of um, educators in settings. And you've touched on it in your presentation. With, and it's uh, we have 39 children and 15 languages in our setting. And we are getting lost in languages and speaking the wrong keywords to the wrong child. And so we found that we've gone back to using only English as because we were all getting confused. So where do we go from there? And I think that's probably pretty typical. I was in a service myself yesterday um, with a, a huge number of different nationalities. They talked about that they bring parents and to to translate some keywords for them and maybe you know prepare some resources for their website for their staff and so on but i think it's probably a very typical experience and it would be useful to hear from you yeah um yeah i i, I saw the question i think it's really really interesting i don't know if christina wants to i see christina has the screen ready so Please go ahead, Francesca. That's a great question. I think we'll take the question. Yeah. And we'll come uh, back. Super. Um, well, uh, 
this is a very high uh, percentage and it's really, uh, really interesting because 15 languages, as I said earlier, uh, are you expected to be learning 15 languages? Okay, you have keywords, so um, you might have chosen um, important words that are important for, say, play or routines or moments of distress um, uh, or greetings, for example. And I don't think it's uh, unusual to feel, okay, well, I am learning these five phrases in Romanian and Russian and Latvian and sometimes not getting it all right because every part of our learning is trial by error a lot of the time and practice. I suppose this is a personal uh, take on it because I, on one hand, I feel the complexity of the number of languages and using you're saying the wrong words to the child so the child doesn't understand um i having my daughter having gone to italian school and her teacher very happily saying i can now speak english to someone speak in english to her and she didn't understand the english of the italian teacher because it's you know it's different uh so it's it is complex um but Returning to only English is maybe safer for everybody, but at the beginning, you could decide that those keywords are maybe you you simplify it for everyone and maybe simplifying, not having seen what you do, I don't know, but simplifying might be having fewer words. So associating those with a specific child or having them on a wall and if having the words on a wall is not enough, you might want to put a uh, a picture of something that reminds you of that child that you, then you might say, okay, yes, I'm saying ciao, but ciao, was it Italian or Spanish or actually even uh, Brazilian people say ciao, French people say ciao. So it, it is understandable that some confusion can happen, but um, it maybe it's, starting over again with uh, either fewer languages or fewer words and then building up from there and making sure that um, you can't expect that this happens overnight because even when I had to learn English it took me I don't know 20 years to learn English so um, learning another language it's like learning a maths formula it's like learning something completely new for someone who hasn't done it before uh, so to start step by step means going in some direction but not rushing it too much because on 15 languages is many different languages then the parents being involved could be an option um, and I suppose when the staff change and this, you know, this came up recently, you know, someone new comes up and how do I teach this person how to say these sentences in 15 languages? So you could record those messages um, and you could have someone like a parent having, uh, I don't know, giving you fi those five sentences recorded in their language. And this can also help you to, it can help people to listen to them on the way to work or to do something else. But maybe an option could be if you've gone back to to uh, English is to introduce the languages little by little and having a, a, a system in place. Uh, and the confusion will be part of the process, I suppose, or the it's not confusion. I don't think it's confusion. It's it's learning. Um, yeah. Mm. Thank you very much, um, Francesca. I have uh, another question here from um, a setting. Uh, who are saying the parents uh, are very insistent that the home language is not used, that it is the, the um, that it's the that they really want their children to be learning English. So yeah. and so I wonder, can you can you speak to that? Yeah, I think the simplest message that you can share is that English, as I said earlier, benefits from the knowledge in the other language. 
Mm. And it, it, we could go and do a big uh, speech about it. But really, the key message is uh, if um, I'll use my children so it's easier <laughs> so that I'm not uh, uh, talking about other people. Uh, if my children, when we went to school in Italy, they came with a huge uh, knowledge of English and very little uh, of Italian. So without that, they would have been a little bit lost. Now, if the focus was only on English, they would have had to, they they couldn't have relied on what they knew. Um, Well, if it was only on Italian, sorry, of what they knew in English. So each language that you have is supporting your learning and I understand a parent who says if there are three hours in the day you'd almost see it as your English immersion because maybe it's the only chance that the child has to really interact in English to really learn English with peers with say native speakers because maybe the family is saying well we don't speak English or we don't feel we speak English very well you are the one who can give the best possible input in English. And what do you do? You speak Italian and Polish. What's going on? You know? Um, and so the, the key message to get across is that, first of all, you use English for the majority of the day. And okay. it's true. It's true. You're not going to be mixing languages all the time. But also that when you're doing this, you're doing this for a reason. It's not a game. It's not a waste of time. It's not useless versus useful languages. You're, you know, and the parents should know, that by using the languages used in the home and in the community, children are also learning something more about English. And... I wonder, you know, and I think this is the simplest message that you can give and slowly you will convince parents because then you, they might see how excited children are when they hear the languages being spoken in the setting, you know. That sounds like good advice, Francesca. Thank you very much. And you you did address that in the webinar and just, I think we have addressed the technical issue that uh, Christina was having. Um, so I'm hoping now that uh, Christina... I can uh, welcome you and invite you to um, to present the, your insights about the pack and how it might be useful in the life of an early year setting. Thanks a million, Christine. Thanks, Teresa, and uh, apologies, everyone, for the delay. Um, <clears throat> I had the pleasure of joining the OWL project a little later in the programme with the development of the provocation pack. Something I noticed really quickly was how the project was framed in research. And I realized that many of my beliefs around multilingualism weren't necessarily right. These are some of the myths that Francesca mentioned as well. I remember one of my initial impressions being, wow. You know, we're we're all very much aware that children are intelligent and incapable and capable each and every day, but particularly when it comes to language learning. A child's ability to hear, process, learn, and express a language is exceptional, but yet it's very natural for them. The language we speak is part of our identity. The English and Irish language are part of my identity. When I was living in New Zealand, where English is one of the three official languages, I worked as part of a diverse multicultural team. The majority of my colleagues spoke English as a second language and were fluent in at least two other languages. I was always impressed by this. When we would share stories about our home culture, people were always surprised to hear that Ireland had its own language other than English. Of course, the next question would then always be, well, can you say something in Irish? In those moments, even though I wasn't able to fluently convey my Irish language skills, I was still incredibly proud of the Irish language. And to be able to teach teach others about our Irish language, which is a big part of our collective history, is a way that I can contribute towards a sustainability. It's a way that I can wear my own identity with pride. As educators, we have that honor of protecting a child's sense of identity through multilingualism. When children are invited and encouraged to express their ideas, opinions, and feelings in their native language, their self-esteem increases. 
which indirectly affects their motivation to learn. Acknowledging multilingualism tells a child, I see you and your family, and you are all important here. It supports children to build a positive identity, developing a stronger sense of belonging to the early year service and the wider community, all of which enhance a child's sense of well-being. Multilingualism is about celebrating rather than fearing the many different languages that might be in a service. They add value rather than challenge to all of to all children's experiences. This provocation pack aims to build your confidence in strengthening your linguistically responsive pedagogy. Linguistic responsiveness refers to teaching practices that support the learning, development, and engagement of children from diverse linguistic backgrounds. A linguistically responsive pedagogy is how educators connect children's home language and backgrounds with the setting. One of the most important ways this pack can be useful to you and to others is to stimulate discussion and reflection. I'm going to share some ideas on how you can use this pack in five different ways. Through staff CPD, curriculum planning, a language rich environment, involving families and storytelling. These are a broad range of activities where you can pick what works best for your service. Every effort you make will be a valuable contribution to the well-being of the multilingual children you work with. So we'll start first with looking at staff continuous professional development sessions. Exploring the pack through CPD sessions creates an opportunity for the team to co-create the training, as it cannot happen without their reflective thinking and perspectives. Hearing someone else's views, whether you agree or disagree with them, stimulates discussion and challenges your thinking. Your attitudes and beliefs as an educator can have an impact on what you expect from children, on the way you interact with them and indirectly on their learning outcomes. Reflecting on your own attitudes helps you to be well informed about the impact they can have. So here's a couple of examples on how you might approach it. As a team, you could reflect on some of these questions individually. Afterwards, you could meet as a group to explore your reflections and thoughts in a discussion. So considering questions like, do you think multilingualism is or is not the norm in Ireland? What are your personal values and beliefs about language learning? What are the challenges and benefits to fostering multilingualism in your setting? Have you come across any of the myths discussed in this pack before? And if you have, how have they influenced you? And how does supporting a child's home language influence their emotional and social well-being? Perhaps you might be interested in exploring multilingualism as a team. So each staff member could review the plaque and share back with the wider team a key takeaway message and a key action they're going to take. This is a great thing to follow up on and see how the actions that people take impact on practice, but also on children's learning outcomes. The OWL project was strongly connected with their national early years frameworks, both Ashtar and Shilta. If you have been interested in exploring areas of these frameworks further, you could dedicate a staff a team meeting to unpacking Ashtar's theme of identity and belonging, or do something similar with Ashtar's, sorry, with Shilta's standard four, 14, also identity and belonging. As a lead educator or manager, you might carry out observations of practice as part of supporting quality. Observations can be a fantastic tool to support educator CPD. You can observe educators in the classroom and how they integrate children's home language into the curriculum and how they communicate with multilingual children. As part of your feedback session, together you can unpack the practice and where it can be extended in the future. After engaging in any of these types of CPD and reflective practice, you might find that your new learning has inspired you to create a new vision and policy on multilingualism, and one that's very much unique to your service. The second area that we will look at is a language-rich environment. Early year settings can be an excellent example of a language-rich environment, which can foster multilingualism for children, their families, and the wider community. A language rich environment considers both the written language, such as text and symbols, and the oral language, words and sounds. There are lots of small actions you can take that can have a big impact. In taking action, you are saying to this child and their family, I respect you and your culture. I want you to feel welcomed and acknowledged, 
and that includes celebrating your home language. So let's start by considering your setting or services environment. What can the child see or hear that represents their home culture and language? I'd invite you all now to take a minute to think about what is it that the child can see and hear? So there's a couple of things that you might like to consider around developing a language rich environment. One, and it's one that I've done myself in the past and have found really insightful, is doing an audit of the storybooks that you have available to the children. Are they all in English or do they represent the languages and cultures of the children in your class? A wider selection of language books encourages families and children to read in the service, but also at home. Families might also be able to lend or donate children's books, magazines, leaflets in their home language, or you could look at seeing if you could lend them from the local library. If you have displays along your walls and windows in the classroom, consider if these are all in English. Could you include a welcome poster that shows many ways to say hello in different languages? If you have posters showing things like healthy foods and colors and or animals, you could ask families to write the names of those items in their home language on the poster itself or on stickers that you could add to it later on. If children create artwork and include their home language as part of that, display it in your classroom, but also in the corridors and at the entrance area. You can also do some of those um, information signs, um, things such as the toilets or exit, and put them into different languages and display them around the service as well. Many children have an interest in music and movement. So when you play music in your service, think about, is it just English language that you have available or do you have songs and stories in other languages? And this is a great way to start working towards a language rich environment that also looks at the oral language. Next year, both Early Childhood Ireland and Mother Tongues will be able to offer you the Owlet recordings. So this is a new project that has uh, just begun this week where we are recording lullabies in 10 different languages. Um, and these will be shared with everyone next year. And we're really excited about this project because it's specifically looking at those one to two year olds and the opportunities for them to hear different music and in particular lullabies in different languages. So one of the last things that you could look at as well around the oral language is you could create a bank of audio files that families can record keywords from their home language. This can include simple and basic terms like yes, no, water, drink, food, toilet. And you can get these recorded on smartphones or tablets. They can help you when you're wanting to learn to pronounce the words, but they can also be played to the children and to the families when needed. So the third area that we'll look at is around curriculum planning. The key to supporting many different languages is integrating them into everyday activities, rather than trying to find the time and effort to create a very specific and special activity. In creating an emergent and inquiry-based curriculum, your relationships with children will be your greatest resource in planning for their learning. So think about lots of different ways that you can get to know the child. If you have a key group of children, you could make a list of each child's ethnicity and what languages are spoken in their home. You could create a world map display and place each child beside their country and also make a note of their language. You could also draw on the rich skills of educators, many who already speak other languages, where they share a language with a family. Perhaps they could talk with the children and get to know their strengths and interests. This information can then be shared back with the wider team and form part of your curriculum planning. As children feel acknowledged and their interests represented, they can feel comfortable and further develop their English language skills. You could also invite parents or a member of the child's extended family to join you for a story time, an art activity or a nature walk, sharing their home language with the children and educators based on whatever the topic is. You could invite families of multilingual children to give a mini language lesson. And this doesn't need to be too elaborate, they can teach the children a few words or sentences and talk about the where the language is spoken and why they know that language. 
if you have a group or circle time as part of your curriculum. You could invite a different child each week to share a word from their home language and explain why they choose that word and what it means. Over time, children and educators learn a new collection of words in different languages. You could even create a word wall display and add to it weekly based on your circle time. Another area to think about within your curriculum planning is any type of pedagogical documentation that you create. Is there an opportunity to include the child's home language in it? For example, if you're writing a learning story, could you start it by saying hello to the child and their family in their home language? Children's songs and nursery rhymes are a fun and educational way to promote many languages and are often a staple resource in any classroom. They are simple and repetitive and children enjoy them. You could search on YouTube for different language songs or ask families if they have music from home that they could lend you. You can even teach the children to say happy birthday in each other's home languages. When you engage in activities that involve multiple languages, it's okay that not all different languages spoken by the children are represented every single time. It's about making sure that every language is included at least once. So next we'll look at involving families as part of the journey in celebrating multilingualism. When I was preparing for this presentation and thinking about, you know, how many languages are spoken in Ireland? How many languages would children have the opportunity to hear? And I came across a statistic that showed over 750,000 people speak a language other than English and Irish at home in Ireland. So that's just about over 15% of our population. This suggests that children across Ireland are hearing and speaking additional languages, and they will be doing so in their earlier services as well. Educators have a very important role to play in educating families about the advantages of bilingualism and multilingualism. It supports children's cognitive abilities and their social learning, identity and belonging. Language can often connect children to their culture. So encourage families to continue using their home language with children. You can support them to understand that this will not affect their ability to learn English, but will actually strengthen their English language skills. So there's a couple of things that you can look at that can really support involving families as part of the journey. So starting at the beginning, when a new child is enrolling, check if your enrollment form has an option to see which languages are spoken at home and share this information with any of the educators who will teach and care for that child so that everyone is informed before the child starts. An important one is to learn the correct spelling on the child's name in particular, if the spelling has different characters to the English alphabet. So an example I often use is, we use a fada in many Irish words, and it changes the way that we pronounce it. This is the same in many other languages too. So take the time to get, the, to, get to know the family well during the transition period. Families can often be more than just a mother and a father. Other family members can have their own home language, and they might want to contribute to the child's learning and development. They're also a great resource that you can connect with. So ask them about their home languages and culture, and if they use different languages in different settings. So like Francesca mentioned, sometimes one parent may only speak their home language in the family home. Let families know how their child is progressing as they settle in, including about their language skills and communication. Families are such a rich source of knowledge, Invite them to share greetings, words, phrases, songs, and written examples of their home language with you. You can also try welcoming families into the service every day by greeting them in their home language. It's not about learning a big part of a new language. It's about learning perhaps how to say hello or goodbye. There's also times when you may have families who may not speak English well. So there's a couple of things to think about in these scenarios. Parents often want to participate much more in their child's learning and development than we're aware of, but they may have limited English language skills. So would there be another family member who's more familiar with the English language who could help translate? Or would you be able to access a translation service? Or would there be an option to provide written information to the family in their home language? Government agencies and county childcare committees often have guidance documents in other languages and you could share these with families. 
Um, perhaps there's educators or other staff members who speak or understand some of the languages spoken by families, and they could help to facilitate the communication during in-person meetings. Every profession has its own specialised language, and the early years is no different. However, not everyone can understand these terms straight away. So think about how you can use plain, common words to help you share information. Writing notes, talking, using pictures, and translating information are all helpful ways of communicating with families. Astra's Guidelines for Good Practice has lots of helpful tips around this area as well. Families are not expecting you to be an expert, but they will really appreciate your interest. Families can really feel valued by your invitation for them to be involved in one way or another. This positive message of being valued is then passed on to their children and to their wider community. And that can really have a powerful effect. So the last area I'm going to talk to you about is storytelling. And this was a key feature within the IELTS project. So this project used an interactive storytelling approach so that the children could tell and listen to their own stories. It can support children in expressing how they perceive their own identities and it can help them in constructing their own narrative. As Francesca so fantastically put it in her blog, we witness the power of storytelling in bringing to the fore all of the children's voices, their own narratives, questions, answers and interpretations of concepts. Storytelling as a pedagogical practice is unique and it's powerful for lots of reasons. It's universal and it's as ancient as people are because storytelling came before writing. It happens in every culture, so you're unlikely to need to have to explain the purpose of it. There are no skills necessary. You can be as creative as you want, using props or books, audio, or just your own voice. It's also recognized worldwide as an approach to play in children's learning. Children can take the lead and it can be easily extended into other activities. Children can also express themselves creatively and imaginatively through sharing their feelings, thoughts and ideas by storytelling and responding to and creating literacy experiences through stories. Within any version of storytelling, we want to create the space and time for children to use their home language if they want to. So here's a couple of ideas that you might like to think about. Talk to children about yourself. Children are always fascinated to learn more about who their educator is. You can use storytelling in many ways and in different moments of the day, and you can also invite families to do the same. Whether you have a theatre or a storytelling corner, you can use objects from your own home or your own childhood to engage children and bring your story to life. Ashtar has a great suggestion around storytelling as well. So they recommend that you can foster storytelling by starting a story about yourself and then explaining to children that they have to continue it. You can expand on this by video recording it and playing it back to them or writing it down and asking the children open-ended questions about it. Storytelling can be a good opportunity to share objects from different cultures or images of faraway places. And this can be a moment to bring up words from different languages. Families can also support you in this area as well. Most storytelling activities that you try in the service are similar ones that can be repeated by families at home. So it's a great way to build that connection between the home and the service. One example I came across was something called Story Circle. So it's designed as a small group activity for children to take turns telling stories. Children can be offered a brief prompt to begin and use their own thoughts and interests to create the story. As educators, we role model storytelling skills by telling our own story in the very first circle. We then facilitate going forward by helping children to take turns and listen to others. As a child-led activity, educators aren't there to correct the language that the children use. We position young children as authorities with valuable knowledge. We create a protected space for the extended use of language, developing a culture of thoughtful listening and maintaining an appreciation for the value of diverse forms of language. So I offered you lots of suggestions there. Some will work for your service, some will be a little bit different and not suitable. But there's a couple of resources that can help you regardless of the approach that you're interested in taking. As we mentioned, talk to your families first, see how they can be involved. There's also online dictionaries that often have 
an option to hear the pronunciation, which can be a great way to get started. And there's also Google Translate. The only thing I'd mention there is it's not always accurate. So try and back it up with another source. And I will finish up here and hand you back to Teresa. Thank you very much, Christina. That was a great presentation. With lots of really very, very useful tips. And throughout your presentation, you addressed some of the questions that um, had been coming in. I mean, I think you you brought a focus on on small groups, the key worker system, which some people were were suggesting that they use that was helpful. We also um, had questions about where the educator isn't confident herself in English. And I think that we've heard loud and clear that that needs to be seen as a strength in uh, if we want to promote um, multilingualism. And you also talked about supports from the city and county childcare committees. And I know that a number of services do get translation supports from the city and county childcare committees. So I would echo that. I think that's a really good idea. We're going to put up an evaluation poll in a few minutes, but I think we have time for one question. Um, if I could indulge the, the panelists and you, this is from uh, one of the people attending tonight who describes, um, you know, a very engaged multilingual um, service and they they use play a lot, which, of course, is appropriate for an early year setting. But they're describing a struggle and we have touched on it where a family has doesn't have any spoken English. And they're trying to communicate as effectively with them as they can. And they're using Google Translate in those conversations, but recognize maybe the limitations that um, Christina has already uh, addressed. So is there anything else that a service like that could be doing to support communication with the child's family? And I'm happy for any of our panelists, um, Francesca or Melissa or Christina, um, but maybe Francesca or Melissa, because Christina, we've just heard from, you might like to answer that question. Um, can I ask one of you to come in there with an answer to that question? Melissa or Francesca? Melissa, yeah. you're going and I suppose, Teresa, it, I mean, Christina really did um, touch on it and, and discuss it within her, her presentation. You know, as Christina was suggesting, is there an opportunity to maybe engage someone within the family? Um, and I know sometimes, obviously, you know, some languages aren't always going to be accounted for, but making things as accessible and easy as possible. So keeping the communication plain, using plain English, mm. using, you know, imagery um, to communicate in a way that can get that message across. Um Christina okay. or Francesca, is there anything that I'm not? Yes, um, some of yeah. some of the the participants are are adding other suggestions, and uh, and I would really echo them. I think our local libraries are really get great yeah. for buying in. They, they may have resources already available to borrow, but the libraries are very open to to bring in and new books that a service can um can borrow um and somebody is suggesting here that lot l o t e languages other than english is a great resource and it is provided through the library so that's i think a good a good tip for people and also grammarly has been suggested and word reference has been suggested so i think there there are yeah, few really good suggestions and uh and i think we'd be happy to recommend those um so i think there's great feedback coming in for all of our presenters so on their behalf i'd like to thank you all i'm going to ask kathleen to upload the evaluation poll now as we come to the end of the webinar um the the expertise on show tonight from Melissa and Francesca and Christina really is incredibly impressive. And I want to thank you all. And I want to also thank the colleagues in the background 
who have been um who've been working away getting us through all of the technical issues and who have um done so much work communicating out to the sector about this both the pack and tonight's webinar and because that takes a lot of work to make events like this happen and i want to Lisa, thank i'm really yeah. sorry to interrupt you but can i just just to clarify around the pack um the pack is available on the it's early electronic pack website yeah, yeah. yeah. and so, uh, but- the, the link is there but what we might do is go back to all of the people who registered yes. And and we will do that. We'll send everybody a live pack. And uh, thank you all for your good wishes. And Kathleen, you might just throw the 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 poll up again. Um, it could be it could be in case anybody didn't get a chance to to complete it. Um, Kathleen, can I ask you to do that? Put the evaluation poll up again. And finally, I would like to remind us all that the project was funded by the Late Late Show Toy Toy Show Fund. Um, and we were so delighted at the time that we that our application with uh, Mother Tongues was successful. And here we are with the with the outcome of all of that work and all of the engagement with the children and the families and the settings. So just to remind us of that. And Christina, it's brilliant that we've started uh, phase two, the Islet project and the lullabies. And I just know that as a resource, that's going to be really, really useful in settings. So Thank you all. Uh, have a good evening. Uh, you're an incredible sector coming out again tonight after a long day's work. Hundreds of people um, who are so interested to take the time out of their, their downtime tonight. Thank you all. It uh, f- shows fantastic commitment to the children in your service. And uh, I wish you all a good evening. Thank you all very much. Thank you.